recording. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am the founder of Humanist Learning Systems and a board member for, I'm, oh, I'm the vice president of the International Humanistic Management Association, USA chapter. My co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm an assistant professor out here in Phoenix, Arizona at Arizona State University, um, and I'm secretary of the Humanistic Management Association USA. We really appreciate you joining us, and we're so thrilled to have Chris with us. And Jen, are you going to introduce him? Yes, I will. <laughs> Our guest today is Chris Murchison. He's a senior consultant, talent development, and organizational culture consultant. He's an independent consultant, coach, and advisor providing partnership to organizational leaders looking to review and enhance their internal practices that impact the employee experience. Before launching his own consultancy in 2016, Chris was the vice president staff development and culture at Hope Lab, which was a non is a nonprofit in Silicon Valley, whose mission is to research and development of new social technologies to promote human resilience and improve both psychological and biological health and well being. He was appointed in 2014 as visiting business leader at the University of Michigan Ross Business School's Center for Positive Organizations, which researches the conditions, values, and virtues that create the conditions for employees to flourish. He also currently serves on the advisory board of the International Positive Psychology Association's Work and Organizations division. Welcome, Chris. We are so excited to have you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Jennifer. Great. So um, we asked you to come in today and you have, um, I asked you to say what's top of mind and you said mattering. <laughs> so if you could uh, just start, I know you have a presentation, go ahead, put it up. So uh, welcome everyone. Before I pop up my slides, I just want to say how delighted I am to have been invited to join the series uh, or the session today, I should say. And it's nice to see you all. Um, if you're brave, I encourage you to take uh, put yourself on video. It's actually helpful giving these talks to see faces in the audience. It kind of creates a, a nice connection for the presenter. Um, thank you, Martina <laughs> and Gap. Thank you. Um, so I thought a long time about what, uh, when Jennifer asked me to come and speak, I thought for a long time about what I might want to share and talk about. Um, and I chose the topic of mattering and then uh, three practices that I thought were really helpful underneath that umbrella. And I'll talk about those uh, in a moment. But um, uh, I have a short, a short presentation, Jennifer, said that I have a strict 10 to 15 minutes. So I wanna fill up that time with a few nuggets of, of wisdom that I've gathered from my career so far. Um, it's clearly, you know, that's not enough time to tell you all of the texture and details and all of the, all of the stuff uh, about this topic, but I hope it's enough that provokes for you some, some thoughts and some questions that we can engage in together uh, once I've given my presentation. So with that, um, let me just walk you through uh, a few slides that I've prepared. Um, so you matter. And so I, again, I thought a long time, for a long time about what I wanted to share today. And what, what came up for me was this, this concept of mattering. And um, it's interesting because this term uh, was one that I was introduced to in graduate school almost 40 years ago. So. Um, um, long time ago, and it, it has stuck with me. And uh, the term um, at the time I was introduced to it was, was one that I learned about in the higher education context. And so at the time I was getting my master's degree in higher education uh, administration and student affairs. And in learning about student development, this concept emerged from uh, a researcher named Nancy Schlossberg um, that really caught my attention. And um, you know, um, at the time, it just struck me uh, as we were kind of working with students to build a sense of community on the campus, but particularly a sense of community for students living in our residence halls. This idea of building a place students felt like they belonged and ultimately felt like they, they mattered um, was one that, that struck not just me, but, but all of us working on the campus at the time as being really kind of core and pivotal to the work that we were doing on campus. Um, the term mattering kind of predates, you know, the, the current vernacular of belonging and uh, DEI even. 
Um, but I think it, it sort of is a nice entry, uh, uh, entry, if you will, into those concepts as well. There's something about the term or just even the word mattering to me that just feels so deeply human uh, and, and seem to speak to and be rooted in this idea that the quality of our relationships, our connections with each other really do uh, make sense, really do matter. Um, I think also particularly uh, right now uh, in the world that we are in, which feels incredibly complex, um, that mattering feels all the more important. And particularly for us as managers and coaches and consultants, uh, the way that we can um, potentially embrace this concept and kind of put practices into action that really create an environment where our students, our coworkers, our direct reports, and whoever we're working with, uh, that we have this possibility, this opportunity to do things that can uh, demonstrate and communicate that, that these people in our spaces, in our communities really do matter. And again, I think right now in our ambiguous and complex and sometimes volatile world, I think mattering matters a lot right now. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit um, to Nancy Schlossberg uh, again, many, 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 many years ago, uh, did this primary research and did it mostly with a focus or largely on a focus on higher education and on students. And one of the things that, that she said that, that uh, spoke to me at the time was that this idea that we are connected by the need to matter and the need to belong. And again, that just rung so deeply true to me 40 years ago. And I think that's why it has stuck with me many decades later that I think, you know, then and now in particular, this, like this idea that like, there's this human desire to feel like we matter to someone, that other people care about us, seems like a primary uh, uh, human emotion. She also says that, that um, mattering is our belief that we matter to someone else. And so again, this idea that, that other people really do are paying attention to and that actually care about us and are thriving is something that I think is, just feels particularly profound to me. Um, in her work, uh, she actually identifies five kind of key things that support mattering. And I just wanna highlight these really quickly, mostly as an entree into what I think are three practices that can put all of these into action. But she talked first about the, the idea that attention is one key factor in producing an experience of mattering. And so the feeling that one commands the interest or notice of another person, that's attention. Importance, uh, to believe that another person cares about what we think, uh, what we do, and is concerned about our fate so that we're important to them. It's an interesting uh, term called ego extension, which basically refers to the feeling that other people will be proud of our accomplishments or saddened by our failures, that other people by extension can feel what we feel and, and have empathy for us. Fourth one was dependence, you know, that our behavior is influenced by our dependence on other people, um, that, that other people can depend on us and we can depend on them, that it's a part of mattering. Then finally, appreciation, you know, the idea that we can be recognized, uh, noticed and recognized uh, by others and thanks for what we do, you know, even if what we do is something that we are expected to do. And sometimes in my consulting, when I talk with uh, managers or employees, I might get the question, it's like, well, that's so-and-so's job. Why do I need to thank them for that? That's just what they're supposed to be doing. And I think you know, when it comes to this idea of mattering that actually you know, the efforts that we produce, whether or not they are expected, um, deserve appreciation, deserve, uh, deserve some kind of uh, acknowledgement as well. So I just share those to kind of give you a little bit of insight into the, the theory that Nancy Schlossberg and her co-authors crafted, again, 40 years ago, that I still think kind of resonate quite powerfully today, and not just for students, but really for, for all of us. So, so within that, with that con within that context, um, there are, I actually think there are three behaviors or three practices that, that I have um, found myself speaking about a lot that feel pretty primary to me for producing an experience of mattering, but also producing um, uh, an employee experience where, where employees actually feel not just that they matter, but that they are given the conditions to thrive. And so for me, those three practices are connection, listening and inquiry. 
So I just want to talk a little bit about, about these three practices and um, what those mean to me. And um, I know all of you online certainly have experience um, even uh, much skill in each of these three areas. And so I think what I'm going to share is what I think are kind of next level skill in these three different areas. And so it's like, if you're into gaming, uh, it's like take, taking it up a level, you know, graduating to that kind of higher level in the gameplay where, where this, yeah, the stakes I feel maybe a little bit higher, but the, the outcome is actually even more powerful. So let's begin with connection. And um, so here, um, I want to refer to an exercise that a dear colleague of mine at University of Michigan um, does um, to help people have uh, some insight into this idea of high quality connections. So not just any kind of connection, but a high quality connection. And so um, when I first met uh, Jane Dutton, uh, who is her name, um, she, she's led a quick uh, check-in with us at a workshop at a conference. And uh, her instructions were to find a partner and within two minutes with your partner, to just create what you believe is a high quality connection. So the instructions were quite simple. And so people paired up and then within two minutes, you found uh, the group alive with the buzz of conversation and activity of people trying to produce what they felt was a high quality connection. At the end of that two minutes, Jane then asked us, you know, how, how did that feel to you? Like, what did it feel like for you to, to be uh, in relationship with someone where the goal was to build a high quality connection? So it's really interesting for me to hear the different things that participants said. And so we talked about things like, um, you know, I felt energized, um, I felt joyful. There were some people who were brought to tears um, in their connections with the other person. And, and most of these people were strangers to us. They weren't people that we knew. Um, other people said things like, you know, I really felt seen or I felt cared for. Uh, I really, you know, that I really felt the other person's presence. And so these are powerful words to, to experience in literally a two minute exchange with a complete stranger <laughs> that Jane had activated within all of us, this sort of opportunity, this next level um, of, of connecting with someone, which she described as high quality. And through, through Jane's research, all of this is actually quite expected that when we have the goal of achieving a high quality connection, it does all kinds of amazing things. It increases oxytocin, it boosts positive emotions, it enhances empathy and activates compassion. It strengthens, strengthens, sorry, strengthens the relationship, builds trust, builds safety. Uh, it can unlock resources. And so when you feel seen and you feel that sense of trust and safety, you just have greater access to your inner resources and greater access to your emotions even uh, that you can then share in, within that relationship. Um, and just you know, so, so, so much more becomes available to you when you have that kind of connection with someone else. So uh, that, that to me was, was quite profound uh, and beautiful to experience and to learn from. And um, so the second part of the exercise was for her to, to ask us, well, what do we actually do to build that high quality connection? So this is the part that I think illuminates the practice. And so people describe things like making eye contact. You know, if you think about your day-to-day -day, um, uh, meanderings through, through your city or your community or wherever you are, you know, how much eye contact do you actually make with other people? I, mean, I live in London and I can say that walking through London, it is not often <laughs> that I have, have much eye contact with anybody. So um, in the, but in those two minutes of that high quality connection exercise, eye contact was, was one thing that people did that really helped create that kind of connection. Other people described a certain kind of presence, like just really physically being with that person. Um, slowing down, so slowing down your breathing, maybe relaxing your body. Those are all things that help you sort of feel more present to the other person. Um, smiling, so being available to that other person, kind of attuning to them, so sort of noticing them, like seeing them. 
Um, and then in a way, kind of in the conversation, acknowledging them, uh, maybe even mirroring back to them what you hear them saying, appreciating them. So that's, you know, a whole host of activities got named that, that actually are things we know we can all do, but they got named in this really precise way um, uh, as an as a opportunity to kind of build, again, what Jane called a high quality connection, a next level kind of connection. You know, part of that part of that exercise that people named as well as as uh, a skill was the practice was the, were the skills of listening and inquiry. And so, as people were talking with each other, it also got named that. Gosh, you know, when my my partner really really listened to me, or they really asked me good questions. So that those are actually my next two practices of the three. So, in addition to connection. I think listening and inquiry are the other two, I think, primary skills that really support um, a goal of, of having other people feel like they matter. So let me talk about listening next. <clears throat> so when I think about next level listening, it, it makes me think, I mean, there are people who research the, the different levels that one can listen. And many of you are probably aware of Otto Scharmer at MIT, but he has a lovely a four level model of listening that he uh, describes beautifully. Um, the, the, the first level he describes as downloading. And so that's something that many of us will default to when we're in a conversation with someone, we feel like we, we have the content knowledge of the conversation. Maybe the content or the information is, is more known to us. And so we tend to do what I would call a kind of uh, head nodding listening. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> I hear you, I get it, you know, head nodding. Um, it's not rude, it's just that, that we're kind of partially listening. We're not fully listening. We're kind of listening enough to understand that we kind of understand what's being said and uh, the data kind of uh, aligns with maybe what we already know. So it's just kind of a, a simple, low level kind of listening. The second level of his listening model is factual. And so it's kind of taking it up a level where it's deeper listening, you're more attentive because the information that's being exchanged might be new to us. And so it may catalyze more curiosity in you and you're generally more open to hearing what the other person is saying. The third level he describes as empathic listening. So this again is going even further where you're listening to the other person with in a way that you want to understand the world through their eyes. So you're extending yourself to kind of really kind of put on their hats and try to understand what they're speaking about from their perspective, from their experience. And then there's the fourth level, uh, the highest level, which I, I think is, is amazing uh, when it can be done. And that's generative listening. So that's, that's uh, other people describe this maybe as 360 listening or embodied listening, but this is the kind of listening where you're listening to a lot more than just a person's words, but you're capturing their emotions, you're capturing their nonverbals, you're, you're sensing the environment, you're really feeling into what they're saying. So it kind of goes beyond empathy and really kind of taking them in in a deeper way um, and in a way where your intuition is, is guiding you to listen in a way that really uh, emanates a kind of energy that supports that person striving towards their best possible self. So um, it's, it's kind of hard to describe. Uh, I know on the receiving end, when I have felt someone listening to me in that way, I feel alive. Like I feel that I am myself open and there's something happening in that moment that makes me feel that I am growing, that I am becoming kind of more of myself. I'm discovering myself through the way that this person is with me and through the way this person is listening to me. So that, that is kind of, again, next level, highest level kind of listening that I think is very, very powerful. There's another person uh, that also talks about this kind of listening. It's a former uh, Ross School of Business uh, faculty member, Melissa Pete, um, and she also pays attention to this special kind of listening. And so she describes generative listening as a method of presence and attunement, curiosity, and hearing that invites people's generative knowledge, basically their full human experience, to come forward and to be expressed. She also describes it in an interesting way as a formula where generative listening equals 
a combination of reverence plus radical curiosity plus profound ignorance, which I just think is so beautiful to be present with someone in a way that you cannot know uh, what their experience is. And so you come to it with this profound radical curiosity and this reverence, this sort of like reverence of this person that you so want them to grow and to be their best self. So um, I just think that is gorgeous. And for me, generative listening, again, is that next level kind of listening and a, definitely a higher calling for managers and leaders as we think about our practice in our roles. And again, I, I think that this kind of listening uh, deeply activates learning and deeply creates the conditions for thriving with the people that we're connecting with. And then the third practice is um, inquiry. And um, so I think the quality of our questions um, when we meet with people is very aligned with the quality of our connection with them. So, you know, through our training, uh, I know we all know about active listening. I know that we all know about open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. Like when I, when it's, it's a kind of inquiry that I know when I have experienced it, it they're the kind of questions that stop me in my tracks. <laughs> they're the kinds of questions that compel me to slow down and to really consider my response. They're the kind of questions that lift me out of the ordinariness of my day from the routines that I just may be running through every day and kind of clicks me up from that to a meta level of consideration of, of the question. Um, and, and, and I think it helps me think about what my response is um, because the response almost requires me to do some self-discovery. <laughs> it's a question that kind of helps me discover a little bit more about who I am and what my experience is at that meta level. And so I, I think those kinds of questions are, are so powerful, especially as we find ourselves increasingly busy in our work lives. You know, the amounts of emails that we get. I mean, I have 400 plus emails in my inbox. It just drives me crazy to see that number. And, you know, the amount of texts and messages and Skypes and Instagram posts. I mean, it's just, it just keeps growing. And, um, and so there's this pace with which my life can move sometimes that just feels hard to keep up with. Um, but when someone you know, takes the time, especially someone that I trust and respect, takes the time to ask me a question that actually compels me to pause, compels me to slow down and just really think about like, what, what is my experience right now? What, what are my aspirations? What is feeling meaningful to me? How am I moving in a way that aligns with my purpose. I mean, the, these kinds of questions, these embodied, uh, this, these embodied questions help me, help me embody my response. Like help me kind of come up with a response that feels more relevant and more useful to me. And so very, very powerful. So um, I just wanna close um, by just emphasizing again that, that I, again, I, again and again and again when I work with my clients that I find myself talking about these three things all the time. <laughs> uh, how to connect, how to listen well, and how to ask good questions. Um, those are just, I think, core skills that every manager um, can do, but can aspire to do again at a higher level. And so that's been my kind of uh, challenge to, to managers uh, in, my, in my client groups is how do you um, bring it up a notch. How do you click up and really focus on um, more skillfully engaging in these practices so that the people that you engage with will have a, a experience of mattering and that you're helping seed for them uh, more of an experience of thriving. So that's, that is me. Again, I could say a lot more about all of these, um, but 
that in a nutshell uh, is what is driving my passion right now in my consulting. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got kicked out for just a second, but I'm sure it's yeah. still recording. So, um, but I did like the parts that I heard. I heard you through the listening and then I got kicked out. Anyways, um, if you have questions for him, please put it in the chat room and Elizabeth and I uh, will get to those questions and ask him on your behalf. Um, so anything that it brought up, please put it in the chat. Um, so Chris, like, as I was taking notes, um, and you were talking about the experience you had with um, creating a next level connection with people. The, one of the notes I made for myself is how do we do that without being creepy? Like I was imagining in the workplace, um, you know, doing this and really making eye contact. And I realized some people might not like that. <laughs> That might not be high quality. It might be very uh, intimidating to, you know, have a high quality connection with people. So, how do we balance the need for high quality connections with um, the reality that it's not that's a heightened state of awareness that's not going to you can't sustain that, right? So, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think as with many things in life, it's a process and a practice, and so. Um, yeah, yes, it could feel creepy if I landed uh, you know, in your office or on a Zoom call and sort of honed in on you to, with this uh, passionate intention to have a high quality connection. That certainly would probably feel very intimidating for most people. And so I, I oftentimes think about uh, the work that I do on an arc. And so when I'm crafting a retreat or when I'm building a new relationship, I typically start with, you know, what, what are the simple things we can do first to begin to just get to know each other, kind of build that sense of acquaintance with each other. And then over time, you kind of build in a little bit more vulnerability, a little bit more sharing so that eventually you get to a point where the quality of that relationship is just increasing over time. And, um, and so for example, when I do retreats with organizations, we, we oftentimes will do a lot of uh, check-in exercises. And in these exercises, uh, I always begin with the simple stuff like, you know, how do you feel about the weather today? Or just something that feels easy to talk about. So like building up those training wheels, if you will. But it's like, it's like, you know, getting people comfortable first so that they then feel like they can take a little bit more risk uh, in the next round of a check-in, for example, and get a little bit more vulnerable. So I, that's the way that I think about it, Jennifer. The, the second thought I had when you were going through that was I was thinking back to different jobs I've had and the friends I made in those jobs and how I'm still friends with them now. I was just texting with a person I used to work with um, before we went on. And it, it dawned on me how important that was, how important those friendships are to the experience at work. And can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I'm sure as many of you know, in um, Gallup's 12, like the 12 questions that Gallup has identified as kind of the core questions to understand the quality of a, a workplace. Um, one of those questions is, do you have a best friend at work? And so I do think to your point, Jennifer, that um, you know, the ability to create a high quality connection with some of your colleagues at work is one of the things that helps create a really positive work experience for you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I do think that, that efforts to build space for high quality connections within a team or, you know, between a manager and a direct report um, really has a profound effect on someone's sense of, of um, connection, um, but also belonging as well and mattering. I'd love as well, just in addition to any, you're on mute, Jennifer, but in addition to any questions you all might have, I'd also be really interested to hear from you, uh, any reflections on the times that you have experienced being really well um, listened to, or the experiences where you've had someone do really exceptional inquiry with you and what that felt like. So I think that would also re be really lovely in our learning space together to kind of hear other examples of, of when, you've, when you have felt those things or experienced and those things. I think the last question I have before we open it up to the chat room is um, the difference between an individual doing this 
and an organization doing this, right? We just were talking about how we as individuals can um, create mattering as individuals with other individuals, but are there ways an organization can help facilitate that? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, if you think about an organization system and the system you know, lives at different levels, the individual level, the group level, and then the whole system level. And I think there are absolutely interventions or practices that you can embed at each of those levels. So for example, you might consider um, you know, what might be supervision practices. And so as managers meet one-on-one -on -one with employees, how might you institute uh, the practice of, of checking in on the human? And so I oftentimes call this um, balancing task and relationship. And so oftentimes in supervision meetings, for example, managers just tend to focus on the work. You know, what are you doing? How's it going? How can I you know, cut the brush out of your way? That, that kind of thing, which is absolutely important and necessary. But what's oftentimes missed is, well, how is the human being doing? <laughs> and so, um, you know, incorporating into that one-on-one -on -one, um, space for well, how are you doing? And then in, in that, uh, you're listening well and practicing really beautiful inquiry. So that's one place. Like another place is in team meetings. And so teams also oftentimes get together and we'll just jump into, okay, what are our tasks? What are our milestones? How are we doing? What's our dashboard? Blah, 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 blah. Great, important, absolutely. But I think we, we don't wanna miss the opportunity to check in on how the team is doing. You know, how are we doing as a team? You know, where are we growing? What are we learning? Where might we be stuck uh, in ways that we actually need to talk about? Um, and I think uh, the more you can build in the training wheels of connecting with each other and the training wheels of, of getting to know each other and expressing more uh, about who we are, you know, the easier it becomes to talk about the hard stuff when the hard stuff comes up. So uh, creating check-ins, for example, for team meetings is another intervention that I think can be really powerful and done skillfully. Then the third level, uh, the whole system level, um, you know, oftentimes organizations have all, uh, all staff retreats or all staff meetings, but times when the whole organization system is coming together. So I think, you know, creating some kinds of practices for those times as well that that builds in this opportunity for for high quality connection and listening and inquiry um, is very very important and then of course you probably need advocates within the organization system to make sure that these practices are being done regularly that they're being done well uh, at all of those three levels elizabeth i think we have some questions in the chat room do you want to yeah, we have some amazing ones. And I'm actually going to start with Jennifer O'Neill's question. And I think Jennifer is with us today. And um, she said she recently became involved in a charity that prior to her appointment had no HR functions for their employees. Her role involves both the board and employees. And she was told that her chief focus should be on compliance. <laughs> Um, she understands this, but in your opinion, what are the absolute core services or practices that she could be introducing um, to the employees and the board? That is not uncommon. <laughs> A lot of organizations um, um, look at human resources as a, a transactional uh, function. And so you know, are people getting paid? Um, are, um, you know, do people have their benefits, you know, those kind of core things, which are absolutely necessary and important. Um, but they kind of neglect um, other things that, that human resources can be doing to support the thriving of the individuals within the organization and the thriving of the organization as a whole. And so um, I think attention, uh, I mean, in my, in my thinking, um, in an ideal world, <laughs> that HR should be focused on those core kind of, you know, some people call them personnel functions. And so again, making sure that those core pieces of, of uh, the employee experience are kind of like the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. Those things are set, they're solid, but also that the experience of those things is high quality. And so uh, I know sometimes that when I go through 
onboarding or I'm filling out paperwork, like sometimes even those processes are designed in a way that it's not very humanizing, <laughs> that feels kind of oppressive or overwhelming, or the language in them is not very friendly. And so I also think, you know, as people are doing those kinds of functions, that they need to pay attention to uh, the design of those systems to make sure that they are friendly and, uh, and um, supportive of employees. Um, other services that I think are really important is learning and development. And so uh, how is the organization growing and learning together and how is that done very intentionally? And uh, you know, as you can appreciate, learning can, you know, takes on a lot of pieces and, and shapes and forms, but having that as, as in, an intention and align, aligning that learning to the ways that you think will support the organization um, being successful in meeting its vision and mission. Uh, that can kind of help you kind of hone in on the places that the organization most needs to learn to, to, um, to be successful. Um, I also think that, um, gosh, my head is full. I mean, there are lots of functions that HR can serve. And so I'm trying to think about what might be, you know, in this context, that what I would say are the most important ones. Um, I think onboarding and offboarding, I mean, those are two practices that I think are very powerful that sometimes don't, uh, that are done in a very transactional way. And, and actually there's opportunity in both of those processes to, again, take it to the next level and think about, well, gosh, how in onboarding do you really pay attention to the employee experience there and making sure that it's setting up that new person to really thrive. And then in the offboarding, right, how do you treat that as an opportunity to really support someone in what will be a major milestone in their career, whether that's you're leading by choice or not, but paying attention to that moment and crafting it in ways that you really support someone's um, uh, movement through that milestone in a way that feels respectful and leaves them feeling kind of hopeful and um, positive. Um, yeah, my head's full. I'm not going to pause there. <laughs> I'm sure there's more that I can answer uh, to that question, Jennifer. I'm happy to talk offline if that would be helpful to you. Um, yeah, Chris, that was actually fantastic. I mean, so what I one of the things I heard is even the, the compliance oriented things, it, the how they are approached can be a instrumental, a, a change inflection point. Um, and then uh, ideally get to the, o the organizational development pieces. Um, we have a couple of questions, one from Bavia and one from Alana that are related. They're both curious about the relationship between mattering and dignity. Um, so Alana's with um, global dignity and she, um, it, rather than mattering, they use the word dignity. Um, and what is, what kind how does dignity play into your work? I, um, can you remind me who asked that question? Alana O'Donnell from Global Dignity. Alana, Alana, would you be would you be open to, to coming on screen with us? Because I'd love to ask you, uh, what does dignity mean to you? Hey, Chris, it's Alana. I'm in sort of a bad environment, so I so I'm here, <laughs> but I'm very happy to at least put my audio on. Great, great, great. Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of our work with with global dignity, I mean, we we do actually use the word matter, um, mm. kind of depending on our audience. I mean, you know, we'll we'll use um, phrases like every person's equal and inherent mm. value. Um, mm. If we're speaking to um, children or, or young people, um, we tend to use the word matter more. It's just it's sort of less of a kind of, I don't know, sort of esoteric, you know, way to describe it. You know, you matter, I matter, we all matter, um, things like that. Um, so I definitely see the, the connection. I'm just kind of curious if the term or the idea is something that um, you think about in your work or comes up or are, are people you know, thinking about this topic that you encounter? Mm, it's such a beautiful word. Um, it's, it's not one that I hear that regularly in my work, um, but it's one that I think fits, fits within um, the context of mattering and, and other kind of positive, um, yeah, I would want to say positive psychology words, if you will, but I think about other words like compassion or empathy, Mattering, for example, I do. I think those kind of do fit within a similar context beautifully. When I think of dignity, 
it's just, this is off the cuff here, but when I think about dignity, I also think about respect. Um, how do we see someone and hold them in a way that deeply um, respects them and their experience and supports them in having an experience that is yeah, um, dignified. Um, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I could see, you know, um, when, when, like, when I think about the three practices that I described today, connection and listening and inquiry, I think within those three practices that there, there are a lot of other things that, that could be tied to that. And so as you're practicing connecting and listening and inquiry, I, I'm certain that one could also be activating the practice of compassion or the practice of, of um, empathy or gratitude. Um, but I could also see you know, that maybe one of the outcomes or goals of, of these three practices could also be dignity. Mm -hmm. And so I do think they are connected. And um, yeah, I think it's something I would love to actually learn a little bit more about. No, thank you so much. I mean, it's, you know, dignity is one of those terms that is not easy um, for to you know to understand and so i really like the word matter because so much of what you said what we're saying mm. um you know this kind of inherent need for connection um yeah. you know to feel that we are equally worthy as as others and so um yeah. i think i might i might start to use your word a little bit more <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think the one place i've heard dignity used more is in religious contexts I don't know yeah. if your organization is a religious one, but that is like an area that I've heard to get used more. Yeah, it's not, but actually our connection, you know, with, with this group is through, you know, um, Michael Pearson um, at the International Human uh, Humanistic Management Association and through his work at Fordham, which is a Jesuit school, which definitely uh, does have that. So yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. So although we're not, um, it it's present in, in all of yeah. those traditions for sure. Mm. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, real quick, I wanna point out that this presentation has been approved by both HRCI and SHRM for continuing education. So if you would like to get a certificate of completion for either of those organizations or both of them or a generic certificate, please, I need your name and your email and which certificates you want in the chat room. Continue. Um, well, I'll go to our next question, um, who's from uh, Claudia, actually, she's doing research um, on um, this topic, but she wanted to know about generational differences, which I think is a really fascinating. She says her parents and grandparents seem to be exceptional at this type of um, mattering and really connecting with people, but the younger generation, you know, in her age, they don't seem to be, you know, and she doesn't hypothesize why, maybe technology or another person pointed out our consumeristic, you know, culture. Um, what, you know, did, have you noticed any generational differences and are there different ways that managers should approach, you know, broaching this topic with people of different ages? What a juicy question. <laughs> um, Claudia, I'd love, again, to maybe invite you to, to share a little bit about what you see and then I could add on. You're on, you're on mute, Claudia. I, thanks a lot, Chris, for being here in this presentation. Um, I, I just wanted to bring up, because I am a professor in business and health sciences, and I'm also continuing to work as an emergency nurse. So um, I work public sector healthcare education, and I have experience in the private sector. And it just seems it's always um, do more with less. And we're uh. in Canada anyways, uh, significant funding cutbacks in healthcare and post-secondary. So it's always, um, there's, literally mm -hmm. uh like the encounters in healthcare are largely poor i will i will say that and um when you actually find that nurse that actually takes the time and has that genuine connection it's not viewed it's not a deliberate strategy it's just mm -hmm. who, who they are and they're realizing really what's most important uh in yeah. life and in that moment and you don't have time like in the emerge we really don't have time to sit and have um, embodied inquiry or compassionate inquiry or anything like that, which takes yeah. time, right? So you might yeah. have like a minute or two to really make a strong connection with someone and get to the yeah. heart of the matter. So it's yeah. very much individual and yeah. realizing how important it is. And, and you don't get that from the larger organization. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. like, honestly, you feel like you're in a bit of a, a 
mm-hmm. on an assembly line. But so, so much of it has to come from the person because within the organizational context and the circumstances we're faced where it's, you yeah. know, unless yeah. it comes from the heart of that individual, it's yeah. just yeah. something to do rather than be who you are. Yeah, yeah, that's really powerful. Um, and as a side note, um, I, I know that there are some people at the Cleveland Clinic who are actually looking into this, um, um, particularly from the perspective of interactions between um, emergency, emergency room staff, so between doctors and nurses within that specific context, but they're really interested in how to create more space for higher quality connections and conversations um, in, in that sort of that intense environment that they find themselves in. And curious about what you know the impact of that would be by extension to patients. Um, so I think that's that's really interesting and important work. Um, you know, as you were talking, it just made me think a lot about kind of a scarcity mindset. And so I think when when we as humans find ourselves in scarcity, that we just don't behave at our best. <laughs> you know, you think about the beginning of the pandemic and you know, like people were hoarding toilet paper and flour and, you know, people were in scarcity mode and just were, were behaving in, in unusual ways. And, um, and so um, when I think about your, your particular environment, what strikes me is, um, one, you know, what might be opportunities to move people out of that scarcity mindset into a, a different mindset. And so, you know, are there opportunities maybe for those people who are motivated to create those high quality connections? How might they in some way um, demonstrate to other people um, the benefits of that? Or could there even be some micro research done to sort of show in some way the benefits of what these individuals are doing so that that practice, that micro practice can be spread uh, more intentionally by the institution? to your initial question around any generational differences about this, um, I do I do think it's interesting. I think naturally, as we get older, we probably tend to slow down a bit and kind of move into more of a wisdom space that maybe opens us up more to these kinds of practices. Um, and I think when we're younger and striving, uh, that we probably are generally busier, and so that maybe the opportunities uh, to slow down feel harder uh, for people who are younger. Um, but I also don't, but I also talk to enough millennials who, who themselves are not happy with how busy they are, that I have some glimmer of hope that, that they, uh, in terms of wanting more purpose in their lives, um, that maybe a part of that is how to slow down and how to move out of scarcity and busyness into a different way of being. Um, and so I, you know, maybe the great resignation is, uh, movement in that direction where people are noticing and wanting something different in their work lives. Um, and so perhaps, you know, perhaps that's a signaling that, that there might be something new on the horizon around people's quality of work and quality of interactions in the workplace. So those are my thoughts. I think that's an important, uh, sorry, one just last comment. You know yeah. that book in praise of slow, but I think that mm-hmm. so much of about is creating a space where people don't feel uh pr- pressured so much and time yeah. is yeah. such an invaluable commodity <laughs> yeah yeah totally one one exercise uh, <clears throat> years ago that someone did uh, in a group that i was in is they had us draw a pie chart of our time and so we all kind of drew like how our time was divided up in the course of a week um but then the second part of that was to do a second pie chart uh, based on our energy during the week. Like where was our energy going? And it was just so, I mean, it was just so fascinating to do this analysis of, of, oh, this is how I'm spending my time, but this is where my energy is going. And I think the aha for many people is that their energy was going to things that just didn't really feel important to them. And it was just a big wake up call. It's like, you know, I really would rather my energy going to things that are meaningful to me. And so uh, it just was a great catalyst for sort of rethinking, well, okay, how do I reimagine my life in a way where the energy is going to the things that I, I wanted to? So, thank you. Yeah.
Um, and Martina Fern had posted a question. She said she really likes the connection exercise and um, would enjoy it. Um, and she's concerned about introverted people who may not um, react positively to it. Um, and she wants to be respectful of their needs. What would be a good way to handle, you know, that kind of deep connection with introverts? Yeah. Um, I'm an introvert myself. <laughs> I So introverts typically... Um, uh, so if you imagine doing this exercise within a group, um, that would be far more intimidating to an introvert than doing it one-on-one -on -one with someone. So I, I do think that there's power. Yeah, introverts tend to prefer intimacy um, and smaller you know, one-on-one -on -one connections or small group connections. And so I do think that in this exercise, the fact that it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, makes it a little bit easier. Um, and I do think that the the... the well, it, it may depend on somewhat on who you're partnered with uh, in the exercise. So I imagine if you were partnered with someone who's very extroverted, that that could be hard for an introvert. I recognize that. Um, but I guess what I would say is that maybe there's a way in setting up the exercise that you uh, create some agreements perhaps um, to kind of make it a bit more of a safe space for introverts. And so even just acknowledging that dynamic uh, before you enter into the exercise, might help the extroverts uh, maybe pull back a little bit and also might encourage the introverts to, to lean in. That's, that's what I would probably do. Martita, did you want to add or did that answer your question? <laughs> Great. Um, well, I'm going to um, switch to Blue, um, Blue Wooldridge's question because he brings up the idea of fear. And he says in you know, cross-cultural communications, two things that he's read about, fear of failure and fear of self-disclosure. Um, are there ways to minimize these fears and consequences um, related to the you matter approach? Mm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I, th um, I think there's always fear involved when you are moving into a vulnerable space. And I think um, particularly in the workplace, uh, I, I mean, what's coming to mind is one particular client that I worked with a few years ago where, where there was a lot of fear in the organization, um, fear about speaking up um, because you might somehow say the wrong thing or appear stupid or incompetent or that there be that there might be some kind of retribution uh, for you speaking up or speaking honestly, and so I think fear is is real in organizations and um, is something that that people counter or have to have to navigate when when they're moving into uh, exercises or contexts where vulnerability is being invited. Um, so here I would probably lean on sort of this, this sort of idea of psychological safety. And so, and also again, that idea of an arc of, of building a connection over time. And so as a manager, um, what I would probably want to do is think intentionally about how I can build a relationship with my direct reports and within my team that builds uh, enough safety, enough trust so that then people can move into vulnerability with the idea that it's a, a helpful thing to do both for themselves, but also for the team. That the things that they're saying are actually useful for the team, necessary for the team and valued. Um, oftentimes that uh, when people are in the fear space, they can't imagine anything but negative consequences. And so I think as you build more safety and as people take initially some micro risks, uh, that those, those will then move into bigger risks for vulnerability and then even bigger risks. And then hopefully on the other end of that, what you have created is a space where people can just show up authentically, express their thoughts and opinions and disagreements, and then not feel like there's going to be any kind of negative retribution for that. But they have to, they have, to have some small experiences of that, uh, of being true, that they can say something and not feel a sense of retribution um, to then be able to take more risks. Um, thank you. I know we're getting near the end of time. I was wondering if you have any resources that you would recommend for our audience members on how they can continue their learning journey to dive into this topic deeper. I saw on your website you have some resources, so I'll post that in the chat here in a moment. Um, anything else that, that you're reading or um, the, um, the uh, Schlossberg articles or that kind of thing? 
Yeah, I'll be happy to send along the things that I mentioned uh, in my talk. Um, Jane Dutton's research, for example, uh, Melissa Pete uh, has some really wonderful articles on her um, concepts of embodied inquiry and generative listening. This, you know, definitely the author Sharma piece on listening. He has a wonderful video where he himself is kind of talking through the four levels of listening, which is, is quite powerful. Um, I'm an avid reader, so honestly, I read. <laughs> I try to read as much as I can uh, about the workplace and about um, uh, the, ex the employee experience. And so uh, I'll just have a look at my bookshelf and see if anything stands out that um, seems related to our conversation today. And I'll make sure when I send out the link to the video and we'll have all that stuff ready for you and included, so. Great, great. So I am the kind of person, so um, I know I talked about busyness, but I do I do respond and so to emails. Um, so if you want to, to chat one on one about any of this, um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I am in London, so just keep that in mind in terms of time zone. Um, but yeah, if any of you want to continue this conversation or just do a bit more of inquiry together, I'm, I'm open to that. So I offer that. So Chris, can I get you to, because we are coming to the end, give us any of your final closing thoughts. Um, that this is a practice um, that uh, as anything and a new, maybe new habit for some of us. And so I, I do, you know, um, I do encourage you uh, to, to begin to think about how you can uh, move towards greater skill in the way that you connect and listen and inquire, and just think about kind of micro moves that you can take to kind of up your um, practice. And uh, you know, we can't all kind of be at that next level right away. So just think about maybe the quality of your practice now and then what you might be able to do to enhance that or amplify it. But I do think moving on that path uh, towards those next level kinds of, of listening and inquiry and connecting is, is very powerful. And I strongly believe that it has um, outsized uh, benefits for, for employees. Those are my closing Thank words. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Again, this has been uh, the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn hosted by the International Humanistic Management Association. We are on the web at humanisticmanagement.international, completely spelled out, um, and we'd love to have you join our organization. We have several live video sessions um, available every month, and um, join us. Thank you.